What the hell has happened to Eden Hazard? Welcome back to One on One, the most in-depth football show on YouTube. On today's episode, we're going to break down Hazard's rocky start at Real Madrid. Since his £100 million move in the summer of 2019, his form and fitness have bottomed out, with Belgium's captain registering just three league goals in his 18 months with the capital club. After an injury hit first season, there was a renewed sense of optimism amongst the Madridistas about the impact that he can have this season, especially after he scored in his first league starts. However, another muscle injury on top of contracting coronavirus means that the now 30-year-old has already missed 20 22 games as of early February. In short, the Belgian is running out of time to salvage his Real Madrid career. There's even been rumours about a sensational return to Chelsea. Before we label him an outright failure, Hazard deserves a fair trial, as is customary on this show. So, dear viewer, you and I are going to work out what's happened, who's to blame, and could it have been avoided? Before we start, I want your gut response. Should he stick it out at Madrid or should he return to Chelsea? Let me know in the comments below. Right, let's have at it, you dirty dogs. Part 1. Real expensive. In June 2019, Real Madrid paid Chelsea a flat £100 million for their number 10, a fee that was actually below his market value of £135 million. Not bad, right? Wrong! On top of the initial £103.5 million, Chelsea could also receive a further windfall of £45 million in bonuses. Admittedly, some of that is performance related. They're not getting the nits on that, are they? So, that's potentially £150 million for a player who, and here's the kicker, was in the final year of his contract. Well, that would be the second highest transfer fee of all time. <laughs> Marina Granovskaya. You know what? Drop her a like to show that you appreciate her bargaining skills. Now, according to this article, Real Madrid didn't even want to pay £100 million. Never mind £150. Shock. Neither would I for a 28-year-old that I could sign in six months' time on a pre-contract especially as he'd made it crystal clear he wasn't signing a new deal at Chelsea and that Real Madrid were his dream club. So, what changed? Basically, Madrid's 18-19 went from bad to worse, winning just one of their final five fixtures and losing an astonishing 12 games in total. Three more than fifth place Getafe. 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 In the absence of CR7, the goals dried up big time, dropping from 2.5 per 19-17-18 to 1.6 per 19-18-19, meaning that the attack was no longer masking deficiencies elsewhere in the side. As a result, they were perilously close to the chasing pack. In short, Real Madrid rompe le cama, which Google Translate reliably informs me is Spanish, for shat the bed. Then there's the small matter of Hazard's massive five-year contract, apparently worth £20 million per season if reports of 400 k a week before tax are led to be believed. So, the total value of the Hazard deal could be somewhere close to £260 million, which is a massive departure from how Perez had run the club the five years prior, when between 2016 and 2019, they actually made a profit on their transfer dealings. In fact, the last time he sanctioned that sort of spend was on James Rodriguez back in 2014. He was released on F3. The club's biggest outlay in that interim period was Vinicius Jr. for £40 million, bought at the tender age of 17-18, more for his promise than his profile, which is a totally different ball game, isn't it? Because he's got five or six years to come good. So, in short, Real Madrid had done a good job of balancing the books and recruiting some interesting youth. Then they finished third for the second consecutive season. And here's where I feel their transfer policy gets a bit higgledy-piggledy. The season after spending £80 million on Mariano Diaz, Brahim Diaz and Vinicius Jr., Real Madrid go and spend £240 million on more attacking reinforcements, bringing in Hazard, Jovic and Rodrigo. Lest we forget that Zidane already had Gareth Bale, James Rodriguez, Marco Asensio, Luca Vasquez, who he was going to work into the team somehow, and Isco. This isn't depth. This is just poor squad management. Maybe spend some money on a Luka Modric replacement. You know, that's just me. What do I know? I'm a YouTuber. The painful thing is that all Real Madrid had to do to claim the 1920 title was shore up their defence. Even with a semi-fit Hazard, they continued to score at roughly the same rate. They just conceded half the amount and went on to be victorious. So the term panic buy springs to mind. But 
if we're going to cut Real Madrid some slack, he did look bloody good in his last season at Chelsea, didn't he? Chapter 2, Hazard's swan song. Despite turning 28 halfway through the 18-19 season, Chelsea's 10, at least on the surface, showed little sign of decline, contributing to 31 goals in 37 league appearances. However, and Real Madrid fans, you're not going to want to hear this, underneath the hood, there were clear signs that he'd overperformed. Plus, his dribbling ability, which was positively superhuman the season before, had also experienced a steep decline. It actually dropped from 6.1 dribbles completed per 90 to 4.2. Potentially an indicator that that trademark explosiveness was starting to slow down. I mean, this is largely unsurprising information given he was a 28-year-old winger. Players in that position normally experience their peak between the ages of 24 and 26. I'm not saying this was enough to put Real Madrid off, but if they'd looked a little bit closer, maybe they would have negotiated that little bit harder. Let's dive a little deeper. Much to his credit, Hazard largely offset this decline in his dribbling with better passing and smarter positional play. He was also taking more shots per 90 than ever before and laying on more key passes. Now all of this sounds bloody swell, doesn't it? After all, not many players can pivot from elite winger to elite playmaker, come second striker, come play wherever the fuck I want in the final third. However, there were moments where it was quantity over quality. And I'm not saying that's entirely Hazard's fault because he was just on a different level to his teammates that season, wasn't he? And was probably well within his rights to be a little bit more speculative. I mean, look at the lack of number nine, for instance. Again, let's dive a little bit deeper. Continuing on this theme, stats provider FBREF actually gave every shot that Hazard took that season an expected goals value of 0.09. Now, just to give you some indication of how middling that is, his shots are actually more valuable now at Real Madrid. They also rated the quality of the chances that he created or his expected assists at 0.29 per 90, which is decent. But for reference, it was only marginally better than Williams 0.27 and he finished the season on just six assists. All in all, it won't surprise you to learn that most stats providers think that Hazard dramatically overperformed across the board, giving him 24 goal involvements instead of 31 for his attacking endeavours. Now, some of you data sceptics might be rolling your eyes because, you know what, sometimes XG just doesn't account for genius. However, 24 goal involvements still would have been his second most productive season at Chelsea in seven years. Plus, four of his 15 goals came from penalties, giving him a non-penalty XG plus A of 0.54 per 90. Now let's have it right. I'm not trying to diminish his returns. That is still very, very good, particularly in the absence of a prolific number nine. What I'm saying is, his 31 goal involvements, when you scratch beneath the surface, not quite as well beating as it first appears. In fact, Hazard's non-penalty expected goals and assists were actually lower than 22-year-old Leroy Sane's that season and 25-year-old Harry Kane's. Potentially better candidates to lump £150 million on. Chapter 3. Real Unlucky Underlying numbers aside, there's no doubt that Eden Hazard's just been really bloody unlucky. He did report to the training camp overweight, which is not great, but then he started the season nursing that hamstring injury, didn't he? Missing the first three league games. When he did return, he looked off the pace, and the club may have been guilty of rushing him back, reflected in his dribble completion numbers, which slumped to as low as 42%. Then, after finally picking up some form, he was injured in that tie against PSG, where he was actually playing very, very well. In a new year, Following his second comeback, in just his second game, I believe, he broke his ankle against Levante. Now, in 2021, his momentum has all but ground to a halt. And all he has to show for half a season is two star turns against Inter Milan in the Champions League. All of this has resulted in some pretty abysmal numbers across the board, including 0.5 key passes per 90, which is the lowest of his career, and just 1.7 shots per 90. He's only had three worse campaigns than that in terms of shot generation. One of them was his first season at Madrid. In summary, maybe don't pay the eighth highest fee of all time for a player who is approaching the end of his prime. Unless he's got cyborg limbs or something. It leaves zero margin for error and the player will inevitably pay for it with his reputation. At the minute, there's a quiet resignation amongst the Los Blancos fans. But Hazard will only be too aware of how quickly Gareth Bale's stock plummeted 
once he became a financial burden on the club. In my opinion, if Real Madrid can claw back a sizable chunk of that massive fee and avoid paying Chelsea any future bonuses, then they should probably do it, especially given the talent they've got waiting in the wings. Here's to hoping that Eden Hazard proves us all wrong and has a stellar end to the 2021 campaign. So guys, that was one-on-one -on -one for this week. What would you like to see me do in future episodes? Let me know in the comments below. So long.